Well, welcome everyone. As you just saw, this is the Open Forum on Escaping Extinction. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this, of course, is the best part of the World Economic Forum at Davos, the Open Forum, where we have the opportunity to speak to the community, hear your questions, learn from you, as well as you learning from us. And today we have um, an extremely distinguished group of panelists to talk about the problem of extinction. So as most of you know, the world is facing an unprecedented loss of biodiversity. Some of you may have heard the live streaming yesterday with Sir David Attenborough, who talked about how in his own lifetime, he has seen dramatic changes all around the globe. And in the past, of course, humans have caused extinction. This is not a new phenomenon. We know about the dodo bird. We know about the passenger pigeon. We know about the decimation of the bison in the American uh, Great Plains. But what's happening today is far more serious, far worse. We are looking at the possible loss of as much as two-thirds of wildlife populations by the year 2020 and of whole ecosystems like the amazing and fantastic coral reef systems of the world. So here to talk about that today is a distinguished panel. And what I'm going to ask the panel to do today is not so much to re reiterate all of the bad news that many of us have already heard uh, and not to leave you depressed, but rather to really focus on the question, how do we stop this? What can we do that will make a difference? And what, what can you do? What can we do? What can the NGOs who are here in Davos this week do? What can the business leaders do? And really to take that message out of this room and into the world so we can act on what we know. So I'm so excited and pleased to be here today with our four panelists. Um, on my far left, your right, is um, Inger Anderson, who is the Director General of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Next to her, Rikin Patel, who is the founder and chief executive officer of avaz.org, which is the world's largest online activist community, and he's one of the forum's young global leaders. Next to him, we have Marco Lambertini, the director general of the World Wildlife Fund International, one of the world's largest and most respected conservation organizations. And next to me, I have the pleasure of sitting next to Hindu Umaru Ibrahim, who's the president of the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad, who has a particular focus on women and climate change in Africa. So I'm so pleased to have all of you here today, <laughs> so pleased to have the panel. And I'm gonna start with Inger and ask her to start us off and just talk to us a little bit about how you view this issue uh, and what we can do about it. Well, when we lose nature, when we lose biodiversity, we're losing a bit of ourselves. And it's something that we need to sort of connect to on many levels. But let me first start with what is it we lose? Well, we lose our food. The food that we eat, where does it come from? It comes from nature. But nature provides these services um, to us. For example, bees. Bees pollinate our fields. Bees make sure that, and insects. Those of you who are around my age will remember driving in cars and the windshield wipers will go when you were driving on a day. And when you came to where you were arriving, you had to clean the windshield. Why? Because there were insects on your windshield. Today, and I see the gentleman here nodding, today, this is not the case. Today, where have the insects gone? We've lost 70% uh, of our insects in many areas, in many ecosystems. This is catastrophic. Not only are insects what <coughs> pollinate, they are also what feed the birds and, and other animals. So our food comes from nature. Um, Every, what is it, every second, uh, one in three mouthfuls that we take comes from bees' pollination. That's remarkable. So bees have a, have a purpose. But it's also our health. Let's think about nature as both the provider of health, nature provides our medicines, but nature is also a pathogen. Nature also provi <laughs> provides diseases. Because, why does that happen? When we go into nature's places where nature need to be, we interfere with it and diseases jump to us. HIV AIDS is one that everyone knows about, but there are many others. Um, malaria, <coughs> when we cut the forest down, malaria goes up by 40%. So there are reasons here to why we need to leave uh, 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 nature intact. Our water, nature is, is and, and species and its intactness are the water factories of the world. Our jobs jobs that we have as farmers, but also uh, in terms of fisheries, etc. and we see that we are losing the fish in the sea. But nature is more than that, and species are more than that. 
They are our heart. They are our joy. They are our lives. They are our good memories. And so when we lose nature, when we lose species, we are losing a part of ourselves. S nature also provides for peace. Intact ecosystems are, where, are more likely to have social harmony. But when all of a sudden ecosystems fall apart, species are gone, we haven't taken care of nature, what happens? What happens is, of course, that you need to migrate, you need to go to somewhere else. What happens is that you fight over resources, conflict breaks out. It should not be a surprise that where we see <coughs> conflict is also where we see nature's implosion. So nature and species and extinction form part of our very existence. So what to do then? Because the loss continues, we are losing species at around an average of a thousand uh, times the natural extinction rate. So action has to be, be taken. And here's the good news, because <coughs> conservation works, and I'm sure that Marco will speak to that. When we invest in nature, nature invests right back in us. If we give nature just half the chance to recover, species can be brought back from the brink of extinction. And some of the, my colleagues in IUCN, many of the colleagues in WWF, have worked on specific species that were nearly extinct and helped bring them back. So nature forgives us for our trespasses more than we know. So, but then how to take this to scale? How to make sure that nature and species are not lost? Well, we need to think about the footprint that we have. We need to think about what the role that each and every one of us have in our daily lives. Many of us will use soaps and shampoos, uh, I hope. <laughs> Many of us will eat food that has, for example, palm oil in it. How is that palm oil produced? Is that produced sustainably? Do we even know? We as consumers, we vote with our Swiss franc bills, or our dollar bills. We decide in a way whether we buy from here or there. We can demand more information on the products that we buy. And, s and, and, and some of us have worked uh, hard on this. Many of the IUCN members indeed have worked just on that. But we also need to help those in government, those who manage large nature-related companies to be better at figuring out how they are doing. And right now, we have a convention called the Biological Diversity Convention that seeks to uh, protect nature. That convention has in it some targets. Those targets are difficult to understand. I think everyone, for when we talk about climate change, understands we cannot afford to have heating be more, global warming be more than 1.5 degrees. People understand that. But it's difficult to measure how we're doing on nature. And so the challenge that we throw to ourselves, to our negotiators, to ourselves in IUCN and to the global community is to demand that we get some tighter, closer, better monitorable and measurable targets within the Biodiversity Convention. <coughs> These targets will be up for renegotiation in 2020. That will help if we get science-based targets. So if I run a business, even a palm oil business, how do I measure that I'm nature positive? What is the footprint that I have? How can I prove and how can I be held to account for the footprint that I put on nature? Um, so the governments have more to do there. Governments also have a role to play in regulations. How do we regulate what is allowed and what is not allowed? Are there incentives that governments could put? The interesting thing is, for example, if we look at the organic uh, produce that we find in, in stores. What happened to the organic market? It has ballooned, quadrupled in the last four years. Why? There's a good brand and so on. This has less of a footprint in terms of pesticides, insecticides, etc. What is it that we can do to learn from that, to do nature positive things uh, on the products that we buy beyond organic? that we know that these have not harmed animals or nature in the, product, pro, uh, in the process of their production. We as consumers, we have a role to play. Governments also have a role to play. Today, many governments subsidize what we call conventional agriculture. Maybe we should be subsidizing a different agriculture. 
We at IUCN, we work on something <coughs> called the uh, IUCN Red List. We refer to it as the barometer of life. It tells us how are we doing in terms of species extinction. And my friends, the news is not very good. We have assessed 97,000 species in C2. You can find it on the web. You will be able to see and play around with it, and you can see the causes of extinction. By far on terrestrial, on land, by far the biggest cause is agriculture and land use changes. That's why I'm talking about food. That's why I'm talking about how we interact with nature. That's where we are losing biodiversity. We're losing biodiversity when we fragment, when we interfere, when we um, destroy intact ecosystems. But we as people, of course, need to live on this good earth. And so, but we need to live on it with harmony, in harmony with nature. And it is entirely possible. And I think that that's the challenge <coughs> that we have to throw to the business community to be more responsible about the products that they produce, to the governmental community to hold to account and to regulate more, and to us as consumers um, to ensure that we ask the right question and demand the right answers for the products that we use so that our impact on nature can be one that will be sure that when you think back or, uh, of a happy time that you had with your grandchild or with your children, or if you think back of the time as a child when you were the happiest, just think. I know that it was a time in nature. It was a time when you were at the beach. It was a time when you were at the mountain. It was a time when the sun rose and there was a beautiful animal standing in front of you. That's speaking to nature too. And we have a responsibility to, pr to protect it. And that's what we're trying to do here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you don't, we'll hold the applause at the end and then we'll have a wild standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> Nick in. Okay. Um, thank you, Ingo. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to start out because I wanted to move to solutions too, Naomi, but I want to check. Um, how many of us feel like we've got a really good handle on the biodiversity crisis? Hands up if you feel that way. Okay. Fair uh, one person <laughs> in the room, thank you. Please come up here from and give WWF. this to me. Yeah, <laughs> you're from WWF. Okay. I'm glad that the WWF staff, staff member has a handle on it. Okay. Um, so I think, it, I think it might be wise to start a little bit at um, what's going on. Um, and I am still learning. Marco just told me a story this morning about the earth tilting that I was like, whoa. Uh, um, you might want to tell that one. Um, sure. What's going on? Um, there is this beautiful journey on our planet of life. You know, life arose, which is bacteria for like a billion years, and then it got more and more sophisticated and more flourishing over hundreds of millions of years. And now we're in this amazing flourishing of all kinds of complex life forms, and it's just a, it's an amazing planet we live on right now. But um, when you look back across the last half billion years, you see these huge spikes where over 75% of all species, all animals died in a very quick period. And over half a billion years, that's only happened five times. And what our scientists are telling us is that right now, the curve of death of species is going up like this. It's looking like we're in the middle of the sixth extinction. And these are the last times it happened, it was because like the earth froze over as an ice ball, you know? Uh, it's that kind of level of catastrophe. <laughs> And what's the catastrophe now? It's us. It's our presence. We are causing the beginning of this huge death of life on the planet. Um, and the danger is it's not just a kind of gradual process. It's not, well, we put up a shopping mall there, so that piece of the, you know, the park was, was killed. It's everything is fragile. Everything is interconnected. So, for example... Uh, certain species. You might say, well, if there's no sea urchins, there's no sea urchins. Unless I won't step on a sea urchin at the beach and it'll hurt my foot, right? But when we saw the sea urchins die in the Caribbean Sea, for example, um, we didn't understand what role they played. And we don't know why they died. Uh, maybe they died because of a lot of fertilizer runoff coming off from, from agricultural activity. But when they died, something much bigger happened. Um, because the sea urchins actually scrub the coral. They eat the algae off the coral. You know, the coral is like the, they're like the cities of the ocean. It's where all the fish are. It's where all the, you all see the shows where you see that. When the sea urchins died, when they got killed off, they could no longer eat the algae off the coral and the coral suffocated. It couldn't breathe. And you had huge die-offs of the coral reefs. And with the coral reefs went fish, went all kinds of other animals. So 
Nature is strong and resilient until it's not. And if we, if we attack it and we kill one piece of it, sometimes the whole rest of the thing can fall away. It's like your own body. Your own, own body can be entirely healthy, and then one thing goes wrong, you know? Uh, maybe in your stomach, maybe in your heart. If that one piece doesn't work, it can take the whole system down. And that's part of what we're seeing in the world right now. We as human beings are assaulting pieces of the ecosystem, killing them off, and that's taking down whole systems, whole regions, whole ecosystems. So that's where we're at. Um, what do we do about it? Uh, the beautiful answer that, that Inger spoke to is um, nature's resilient, it can recover. The thing we need to recognize is that we need to give it the space to recover. Uh, we have no idea how ecosystems work. Like we, that technology is way beyond us. We, we had this experiment where we tried to create a biosphere in Texas and like live inside a self-contained environment, human beings, you know, where everything was recycled, everything, there was no in contact with the outside world, and it went haywire. It went nuts. There was all kinds of bugs and everything went crazy and the people inside it went crazy and like we don't know how to, how to create an ecosystem. Nature does. Um, and so what we found is if we just leave it alone, we just let nature do what it's gonna do. For a certain percentage of an area, it sustains the rest of us. It sustains the rest of the ecosystem. Just leave it alone. And some of our leading, most wonderful biologists have said that roughly, generally, if we leave half the Earth alone, um, and we take care of the rest, because <laughs> if we do climate change, if we keep burning fossil fuels, doesn't matter. You can have the most thriving life in the world you want, but we're all, we're all gonna burn if we, if we keep burning those fossil fuels. Um, so we have to take care of the whole Earth, but to prevent this mass extinction and this collapse in, our, in life, <coughs> if we just protect half the Earth, uh, we can sustain. Uh, we can sustain nature. And so that's the beautiful vision um, of, uh, of, of how we fix this. And I think it's a wonderful vision for all of us because it's something all of us can pursue. All of us can, can uh, it's not just like governments need to designate national parks and stuff like that. All of us can say, this piece of land in our community, our village, our town, uh, this is collective land, we're gonna say that piece isn't gonna be developed. We're gonna protect it for nature. We can say private landowners, you know, um, some of us might know people who own land. We might, we might own land ourselves. You can take your own property and say, half of my property is gonna be protected for nature. And you can change the title on your property and forever after that, no one can touch that, that piece of nature. And if we all do this, and it all adds up in smart ways uh, that we're protecting the right bits of nature, uh, we can do this. And it's, we're not so far from it. Like only about 55, 54% of the world right now is directly occupied by us. We've just sort of crossed that 50% line. Um, and that might be partly why this extinction is curving up. We need to stop and move backwards. And when we do move backwards, nature recovers quickly. Um, so that's the beautiful, that's, there are many answers and solutions, and, and Inga was speaking to a few really great solutions, but that's the one I wanna, I wanna offer you as a vision for how we just fix this, and it's a beautiful one. And the last thing I wanna say about this <coughs> is that um, it really is not about like us and nature. And that vision is so wrong, <laughs> you know? We are animals, <laughs> we are nature. Um, and I think there's something deep in what we're seeing here. Like, there's a lot of fear in the world today, right? Um, there's a lot of powerful forces moving. And I feel like in our politics, you see things both great and terrible sort of waiting to be born. And will fear or will love kind of dominate our future? And this connection to nature, this sense of whether we are fostering and stewarding and living in harmony with nature, I think is one of the core things at that, at that ferment of how we're all feeling. Um, you know, a lot of people that I know, they flip quickly from being like, eh, it doesn't matter if we you know, develop a few more areas and build a few more buildings. Yeah, there'll be a lot, there won't be a forest there, no big deal. And then they flip quickly, once you explain all this to them, to like, oh, that's it, we're done, we're baked, you know, it's over. Um, we suck, humans are terrible, it'd be better when we're gone, you know, quickly to the fatalism. And there's a space in between there um, where we see that it's happening and we ask, is this us? Is this really what we, are we like a <coughs> virus on the planet just destroying it and eating it? Are we like locusts, you know, like, like grasshoppers just destroying the, the planet? Or are we something better than that? And what I see in rooms like this is people coming to the recognition that we are, we are better than that. That's not who we are. We are stewards of this earth. We, we live in harmony with life and we celebrate it. We are life. 
And, and those of us, you know, how many of you have had an experience where you went into a forest or you walked in nature and you just had a good insight, you know, something that really spoke to you as you were, as you were in nature? How many of you have had that, that kind of experience? Look at that, right? So we may not understand the biodiversity crisis, but do we understand the connection with nature, right? And what it gives us and what it does for us. That's what this is about. It's about us, about our own journey on this planet and who we are. And I think that this opportunity to stand up for life and save all life, we're also gonna save ourselves. And we're also gonna emerge stronger and wiser from it. Thank you. Thanks so much, that was great. It reminds mm -hmm. me of, you know, scientists often talk about ecosystem services and all the utilitarian reasons why we should preserve nature. But when the US Forest Service did a survey of Americans and asked, why do you go to the forests? The number one answer people had was because I love it, because <laughs> I love camping out, because I love walking in the woods. And yet, you know, scientists all never use the word love because that's not a scientific concept, but in a way it needs well, to be, right? It is, yeah. Marco. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, listen, I, I think everybody um, has um, an interesting um, journey in his life um, that brings us close to nature. I guess many of you have gone through different paths to be interested in, in nature and wildlife. I, I was born crazy about nature and wildlife. When I was um, four years old, my mother told me she opened the closet to my bedroom and inside there were rocks and dead insects and all that kind of stuff. She was a bit worried at the beginning, um, but then she ended up actually supporting this passion that I had inside myself. I don't know how many of you were born uh, uh, fascinated by nature and wildlife. I think the majority of people actually are uh, because this is the way we survived for the majority of our life history as humans. We, we were born into nature. We were, we were um, fascinated by nature. We needed to understand nature to survive for so much of our human uh, history um, since a million years ago to today. Only recently, we became detached from nature. We insulated ourselves in cities, uh, most, of, most of us, not you in Davos, you have nature just mm -hmm. your neighborhood, um, but the majority of the population is really beginning to create um, a barrier between us and nature, because nature in the past was not very comfortable, was tough. Living in nature uh, in the way we were living uh, in our early days is really tough. Anyway, I was, um, I was um, uh, crazy about wildlife since I was a kid, and when I was 12 years old, I can see so many young kids. How many of you is 12 years old or 13? Here we go. So when I was your age, uh, I joined WWF uh, in... <laughs> Dan Moore, yes. I, I joined WWF um, uh, in my own town as a member, and I started raising funds for a project which was saving the last 20 wolves left in my country. 20 wolves left in my country. And, um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, my journey continued and I, I, and, and, and I ended up in WF uh, today as, as a professional. But that passion stayed with me until today. And I you know what? I joined WF in this job four years ago. And that <laughs> the month uh, of April, I was in, in my country. Uh, I have a house there. And you know what? In the evening, a wolf showed up in my house. Mm -hmm. I'm not joking. <laughs> now in Italy there are about 3,000 wolves uh, from the 20, uh, and, uh, and they're actually coming to Switzerland, as you know, <laughs> from Italy, and then to France and so on, and, and Germany as well, and there are a lot of success stories, and it's all about coexistence. It's all about understanding, first of all, that the web of life that is made of wolves and bees and so many other things Inger and Rick and mentioned are the foundation of the functioning of the planet. Imagine, a, instead of a web of life that is a little bit of a difficult concept, imagine a wall of life made of bricks, where those bricks are actually the different species. And we are taking those bricks one by one out of the wall. Mm. The wall will collapse. When you look at the forest, and it's so beautiful, and it's so green, we often look at the forest but we don't actually see what the forest is made about. The forest is not just a patch of green and trees alone. It's a combination of thousands, it's thousands of different species and millions and millions of individuals of those species interacting with each other every single second, and every second is different, to make the forest alive and working and functioning. 
the balance that Rickin was mentioning is fundamental. And life today is so complex, has evolved over so many hundreds of millions of years, that we reach the point where that complexity supports life itself. If we banalize, if we simplify nature too much, if we take away species, we destroy spaces, that complexity will not be able to persist. And everything will collapse. And when we say we collapse, we should be sad about it, emotionally, because I am emotional about nature, most of us are, I think, in this room. But it's not enough. We should just be sad about the loss of nature. We should also be very, very worried. Because as somebody said earlier, all of, 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 of the previous speakers, nature is providing for us, for us, to us, every day for free, fundamental services that unfortunately has been there all the time and we continue to take for granted. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the water we use for agriculture, the water we use for uh, 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 our industries, pollination of our crops, stable climate, all that kind of stuff, we take it for granted and we shouldn't because it's not for granted. These things can change and if they change, they change in a way nature change. They change gradually, 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 the degradation and the decline, and then they reach a threshold, a point in time, where the system really go down a rapid, rapid degradation. And they can even enter a state that is difficult to revert in the, in the short time. The loss of nature is something that we should fight against for the moral responsibility that we have to share the planet with so many other species that have accompanied us on this journey since the beginning, and we have the moral responsibility to care for, but also in our own interest, because without nature, we are going to be deprived of many services that we need to survive, we need for our health, we need for our well-being, we need for our economy, and because, as I said, nature gives us also so many emotions, inspiration, and happiness. So um, that's what we are fighting for, and I think this is a narrative that needs to be combined the moral responsibility on one hand, but also the self-interest in protecting nature, which is fundamental to the survival of ourselves. Thank you. Cindy. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. I think you will hear a lot from the previous colleagues. Like, looks like uh, it left nothing to, to say, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, let, let me tell you, I'm coming from the indigenous communities who are about 400 million around the world but protecting more than 80% of the world biodiversity. Because we are living in the mountain, ice, forest, all the landscape, all the different ecosystem that indigenous peoples are living there. So let me give you the direct example of myself. I'm coming from Chad, I'm coming from Mbororo pastoralists, who are the community are living as nomadic life with the cattle. So we are moving continuously from one place to another one to find water and pasture for our cattle. So that's our relationship with the environment. So that means we depend <coughs> from the environment, from what our food, our medicine, our supermarket, everything coming from the environment because there is no school, no hospital from our communities. But also the environment is dependent from us because we have the duty to protect it. So for us, the loss of the biodiversity and coming from Chad, I, I actually left it myself. So since I was uh, very young, I know exactly how many species of the bears, of the insect, of the herb that disappear, disappear forever. Because I used to play with it. We used to catch some birds and play with them. We used to use all the different pasture for our cattle. And then actually now you go to the same place, you do not find the same biodiversity. You found the new herb that we are calling it bad herb. Why is bad herb? Because the cattle cannot eat them. And then it's not useful for the agriculture. So the ecosystem is changing, then changing a lot. And that not only impacting the world wild who is escaping, like you have a lot of lions. Now we have, like, we have to protect all the uh, elephants. We have to protect rhinos. Why we have to protect them? Who is tanking them? Because we is tank them. When we is tanks, as all the colleagues say, one of the species of the biodiversity is going to be a channel, is tank everything of them. 
So then now we have like we have to protect them. So to protect them, I think they protect themselves because we destroy them. So how we destroy them from our side is coming from the industrialization revolutions from the world. So because we didn't create anything. But from all the weather changing, we have the climate change coming. So in my regions and in my country, we have like the three season. Rain season, dry season, and cold season. Of course, our cold season is not like here. <laughs> it's not mine 20, but it's like 25 degrees, but we're really feeling cold. So I'm freezing here for sure. So actually now, for the last three or four years, the cold season disappeared because the cold season become like 35 degrees. I know that 35 degrees for you is like the hot summer, so this is become like the cold season for us. And the impact, the consequence of it, is loss of a lot of biodiversity of it. Because during each season, there is different uh, species of insect or of biodiversity, of, of reproduction of all the species. And then if this season is missed, so it's meaning that it's missing a lot of things in our biodiversity. So that's why they are saying we lost 60% of the biodiversity around the world. So for us, this impact become in our life directly because we are losing a lot of water. I know that in summer here in Switzerland, like there was lack of water, helicopter, like uh, getting the fresh water to the peoples. So imagine from uh, our case where there is no car or there is no motorbike to go, how the people are going to get the water to the Ada or to the cattle to drink. So that's the importance of why we need to protect the biodiversity. So for us, protecting the biodiversity is not like having the beautiful animals that we can go to the safari and then see them, or then we can have like a forest we can go and walk around. Protecting biodiversity for me is protecting our life protecting our livelihood, protecting our species and our sustainability at all. So how we do that? Coming from the community, we do that in our daily life because we depend on it. If we lose it, we are going to lose our life. So being the nomadic, moving from one place to another one, that's mean when we stay two days here, we live three days to another place. We live for the to another one. So this is the entire life we are doing the circle. So it's long, you can say, but it's not long for the ecosystem. So that's exactly what, what also the colleagues said. That's leaving the ecosystem to get regenerated naturally. So we have to give the breath to the ecosystem to do not make the pressure. So this our life pathway. So we give the bread to this ecosystem to get regenerated because our cattle sheep as a natural fertilizer for this land where we are living on it. And when we, we go all our movement and we come back, so we found again the food for our cattle and for ourselves and the medicine. So that's the life we are doing. But this life now in treating. So treating by the beak and this tree making like a big agriculture and grabbing the lands. So this is the not life in harmony. So how we can restore this life in harmony? I think firstly is going back to the peoples who are depending from this environment. Because as also colleagues said, peoples who are in town, maybe waiting the end of the month to get the salaries, go to the supermarket, fill the fridge, and then eat every day. But we have to think about where is the food that we are buying from the supermarket coming from? It's coming from these small scale holders, coming from the rural area, from the agriculture person, from the farmers, from the pastoralists, from the fishermen that you do not know. So this food coming from those peoples. So if we want to sustain our food system, we have to protect these peoples who are the origin and who are protecting, who are producing. So to protect them, I think we need to recognize what they are doing and buy from them and then to do not waste. So something that I see in Europe when I come is the food waste. So food waste is part of the environment. And then like the reason that they are giving is like, yeah, hygienically when you eat and something rests so you cannot eat it, you have to throw it. I'm like, you are throwing a food like, yes, it's good for your health. But do you imagine like this food coming from how many energy of someone who produces it? So you need to think about how it's come before to throw it. 
So what we have to do also, we have to think about our consumptions and about our productions. So sustainable consumption and production also restore the environment and restore the natural resources. And then when we are buying, we are buying from who? So it's always like good to buy from the outside and see. But how about your local food? So how to develop this local? So developing the local, maybe it's expensive because people are shifting now. Oh, we have to eat bio because bio is really healthy. So this is very important. Yes, it's important, of course. So why you didn't think about the bio is very important. So if you think about bio important from the beginning, then now it's becoming expensive for the developed countries because it's very small community who are doing it. So how, how you cannot like sustain and then say like, we have to ban all the pesticides because this is the one who is killing our environment. And then maybe by the next 10 years, we are going 100% bio. Like in my community, <laughs> we are living bio. We don't need to go to the supermarket to buy bio because we don't have this pesticide. We have all, all already living the bio. But if this bio is not sustained from the people who are consumed, so that going to shift also this natural food to not natural one. So using the traditional knowledge now, so from our side, how we can also help Technology is important, science is important, but one thing that left, like I thought at the beginning, 80% of the world biodiversity is a lot that we are protecting. How we are protecting? We protect it from our indigenous people's traditional knowledge. One of the example I give you, maybe today someone from uh, here want to go to ski because the ski is the, uh, I mean, easy and beautiful things that people are doing here. But you can go skiing when there is sunny, even it's cold, but it's sunny, it's much better. So or when it's cloudy, you can say, oh, no, maybe I can wait for tomorrow, it's much sunny. But you can check that just in your iPhone to see, like, in the app that it's going to be sunny or not to go to ski. But from our side, we check this knowledge through the environment. So we check it just to say it's going to rain or not from the environment observation. We observe the trees, the tree flowers. We observe the plant. We observe the migration of the bears. We observe the insect. So let me give you the example, like a daily predictions. So when we want to see it's going to rain today or not, it's going to rain in the next couple of hours, we know exactly how we know it from the insect. When the insect is start coming out or taking uh, them food quickly inside, it's not cloudy, but we know we have to start packing our, our things because it's going to rain exactly. And then, like when we have like year productions, so year production is not coming from the meteorological peoples because they always collapsing. They can tell you like next week is going to snow, but it's not going to snow. It's going to be sunny. But from our side, we say like next year how the weather is going to look like. So to do so, we observe from the this year fruits of trees. We break them. We see inside because trees do not speak, but they want to ensure them generations. So to ensure them generations, they do that through the fruits that they produce. So we see that. We say, okay, this is just one indicator. It's fine. So we see again another one. So through the laser who are giving babies. So for us, it's very important, each species of biodiversity. So when they give a lot of baby or they do not give, so we know that exactly how it's going to look the next year. So for us, like observing the environment and protecting if each species is giving us the planning prod predictions and on also protections of this environment. So that's help us to make our plan for adaptations and for mitigations. So this likely recognized this year, no, recognized uh, four years ago in the COP21 through the Paris Agreement, the indigenous people's traditional knowledge who can be as the science knowledge to help adaptation and mitigations. But that need to be shared through all the other peoples. I know that you have your own traditional knowledge, probably maybe when you expect it's not it's going, it's melting or not. So why we cannot promote this one and then learn about it and then learn from this environment what it's giving us. So that's what I have to live with you and live with you for each action count.
You can say, I'm young. You can say, I'm older. But what you are doing is matter. Not matter only for yourself, but matter for our peoples, for our communities who are living very far from here, but who are sharing with you the same air, the same water, and who need the food to eat. Thank you. Well, thank you all for those great comments. And I'm glad that you said older, not old. That makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing I hear in all of your comments, it seems that everyone agrees that nature, the environment, is not something out there, but that we are in nature and nature is in us. It's part of our lives. It's part of our livelihoods. It's part of our knowledge. Uh, it's part of our identity. And yet, it seems to me that many people don't actually feel that way about nature. And in my public talks, and I apologize, I realize I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Naomi Oreskes. I'm a professor of the history of science and technology. I do a lot of public speaking about climate change and other environmental issues. Um, and in, in that work, in my public lectures, I've often received pushback from people who say something that goes like this. And often it is older people. They'll say, well, scientists have been warning about collapse you know, since I was a kid, and it hasn't happened. And therefore, I don't believe it. <coughs> so I wanted to throw this back to you and invite you to respond to that in whatever way you see fit. Because of course, we could argue that actually the collapse is happening. And so one question is, why don't people see that? Why don't they feel it? Why don't they know it? Um, you know, have we somehow failed to communicate adequately, or is there some kind of a gap between people's daily experiences and these larger things? And then I also wanted to throw out the issue of technology, because we are at the World Economic Forum, and we know that many of our colleagues here are technophiles, uh, or even technophideists, I like to call them, people with great faith in the power of technology to solve problems. And of course, many technologies are powerful, and some of them do solve problems, but you know, I have colleagues in my own <coughs> university at home who think that we can deal with extinction by bringing back extinct species through biotechnology. And, you know, this isn't science fiction. I have colleagues who are doing this or attempting to do this even as we speak uh, through recovering DNA from woolly mammoths and other such things. Um, and many of them think that this will, in fact, be the solution to the biodiversity crisis. Um, other people we know, including some here at the, at the forum, think that biotechnology will help us produce artificial food, artificial meat, for example. Um, some of us have been to panels on that that will solve the food problem. So I want to throw those two ideas out to you to respond in whatever way you see fit. Michael? OK. <laughs> um, listen, I think um, it is a real issue, uh, particularly your first point about not appreciating the level of uh, change that we're going through. I think on climate, I think that actually we are beginning to see it. And for climate, it's easier because uh, everybody is affected by climate change in different ways. You feel it on your skin, really. It's hotter. And we had here in Switzerland, I've been living here for five years, uh, we had extremely hot heat waves coming our way. Um, sometimes it's even s too cold for a short period of time. There's not enough snow, uh, people cannot ski here, <laughs> and they feel it in that way. There's so many different ways we feel climate change. So climate change is now beginning to actually reach a point where people are, are feeling it, and as a consequence of that, we're responding. We are a species not programmed to long-term planning. We're super bad at planning in the long term. We need to hit the problem, and then we're responding. And this is what happening with climate change, which is sad, but it's a reality. So. With nature, is much more complicated because um, the, the, the symptoms of nature degradation, uh, deforestation, overfishing, are much more subtle and much more difficult to appreciate. But they're beginning to become evident. And uh, for example, you know, I was, I was uh, talking to our WWF um, office in Australia. Australian people are shocked right now. They are shocked. They are shocked because one of the treasure of their country even just from an aesthetic and, and, and tourism and, and, and proud uh, point of view, the Great Barrier Reef, which is this massive barrier of, of coral reefs um, uh, on the eastern coast of Australia, is dying. And it's dying before their eyes. And it's dying uh, so fast that in the last 10 years, they have lost almost half of it. 
And it's dying in a way that you can see it, because it's getting white, dead. So, you know, <laughs> these are the things that people need to appreciate and, 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 and experience in order to trigger response. Of course, we don't want to wait for that moment. And, and that's what I said before, the, the tragic danger of nature loss is that we're losing, losing, losing. Nothing seems to change too much until there is a point where everything changed very fast. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to internalize. It's not instinctive to understand for us, but we need to make an effort with our minds to understand that this is what's happening. Understand science, science has never been clearer, and we need to then interpret that science in simple ways, <laughs> and that's the problem that sometimes science uh, you know, is too complicated. And it's our job as WBF, as Avaz, as SCN, everybody, to, to simplify the message. But that's what we need to internalize. We cannot take nature for granted. We cannot, and that's a cultural evolution. Everybody here in the, in the forum talk about technological revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. This is great, technology is gonna help a lot. Although technology has created a lot of the problems too. Uh, there are always the unintended consequences, but um, then we need to take care of. But the technological revolution is fundamental, <coughs> but even more so is a cultural revolution. Valuing nature and understanding what's happening and change our behaviors to prevent the worst from happening. Yeah, I think I want to take both your questions together because I think in some ways they're the same question uh, in the sense that, yeah, a lot of us are disconnected from this. We don't see it happening. Um, we don't see how the, the sophistication of what's happening. Um, and I think that's part of the cultural revolution we need. Uh, the breakfast you ate this morning probably came from all four corners of the world. Like the, the utensils you use, the food you use, the, the, the appliances you used. Um, we are so interconnected now as a, as a planet that something that happens anywhere can affect everywhere. Everything goes viral now, whether it's a financial crisis that happens in one place and spreads, or whether it's a, a, a virus that takes hold, or whether it's an idea, good or bad, it fires around the world so quickly. Um, and, and the technology piece, that technology will either help us to grow our wisdom or diminish that wisdom. So the technology that I see being most important uh, to this, to the, to, the, to the crisis of life on Earth, is the technology of our connection. Yeah. How do we connect to each other? How do we share ideas? How do we understand each other? And we've been seeing a growing way in which the way in which we are help actually connected to each other, our consciousness, whether it's through TV or through radio or through, through the internet, it's been growing as well. And we've felt like more and more like we're human beings. And we're together as one people, holding and stewarding life together. And social media and the internet has been a massive acceleration in that type of connection. And, and that's the technology that I feel, win or lose, <coughs> could determine our fate. Because that technology can be sick or it could be healthy. There's a, there's a good book called The Global Brain about the idea that if you, th if you think of us as life and you think of everything that's going on here as natural, let's imagine that technology is something that an animal has produced. You know, uh, and in that way it's natural. Um, it's a product of life evolving on Earth. We've evolved to be these kinds of beings, with these kinds of brains, and to create stuff like the internet. And that's actually how life is evolving on Earth. Just, just consider that for a second. You know, there's an analogy that what we are is a bit like a global brain. You know, neurons in your brain, they like fire and they connect to other neurons, and it's a bit like us as people. We have an idea, we share it, it goes to other people, and ones that carry in waves and move and sort of, th they become the thoughts of, of our brains or of our global brain, of our culture. And I think that right now, our technology of connection, our social media, is central to that process, but it's sick. We basically have a mental illness. Um, when you look at Facebook and Twitter and Google and WhatsApp and all these, all these firms, the, a huge percentage of what you see on those uh, sites is fake. A huge percentage, and we don't know that. It's designed to look real, but it's actually fake. Trust me, I've done the, all the research on this, I've talked to all the executives, it's not real. Um, it's stuff that's been created to be fake, to be posing. Um, and that's not real people, real voices. Uh, that's not authenticity. And, and another huge percentage is determined by a, an algorithm, a, um, an artificial intelligence that tells you what it thinks you want to see. And that also is kind of weird and messed up and telling us crazy stuff, like forcing crazy stuff down our throats on YouTube. I mean, how many people here log in and watch YouTube a lot? Like, yeah, we can admit it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, to the AI, the artificial intelligence on YouTube, 
has gotten so smart that over the past 18 months, we're now 2 billion of us watching a half hour to an hour of YouTube a day. But if you click on anything around, by, you know, anything we've been talking about, any current events thing, and then you see what YouTube recommends to you. 70% of what we watch on YouTube is something they say to us, hey, watch this next. You're two or three clicks away from insanity, like pure stupid stuff that anybody reason will be like, come on, that's, that's ridiculous. Like, that's what it's forcing down our throats. And it's not any person making that decision. It's an artificial intelligence gone mad with the one goal that the corporation gave it, keep people on our site, keep people on our site, right? So, we, so, we, so this is natural process. We've evolved the internet. It's beautiful, could connect us like never before to face our challenges together, but it's got a mental illness. And we've got to fix these firms. So I really feel like one of the number one things we can do to save life on Earth is to fix Facebook and Google and Twitter and WhatsApp <laughs> and all these things. Agreed. And that's the technology <laughs> that we need. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Agree. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to quote you on that. Ali. No, oh, it's on quote. Ali. Ali is first. Oh, okay. respect. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that henceforth because uh, I hadn't thought of it like this, but it's very interesting. Look, um, on, on this sort of sense in some communities that, well, uh, this is not something that's really going to have meaning, um, I think we, 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 we have understood, and Marco refer, refer, referred to that, that climate is real because it came to our door. It came to our door in huge floods. It came to our door in droughts. It came to our door in terms of no snow or very boiling uh, summers. In Australia just now, a month ago, this absurdly heat, absurd heat wave where fish were dying in the rivers, where uh, about, what was it? I, they gave me the number to tell you. It's um, a, a vast amount of flying foxes. One third of the species went, died. They fell out of the tree. These flying fox, uh, flying um, uh, bats, uh, uh, spectacled foxes they're called, mm. fell out of the trees and died because of heat. Now this is unheard of. So the six mass extinction is augmented and accelerated by climate change and by what we're doing. So we are understanding climate change. We haven't quite yet understood that these species that we are losing are the very fundament on upon which we're standing. But think of it like a plane. You're flying along in this plane. And you say, you know, seat 47H, out the window it goes. Because what does that do? You know, I have 47 genes, so I don't need 47H, out it goes. Oh, well, you know, and one by one, you throw out these things out of the plane, but at some point, the plane no longer can function. That's a planet. And, and, and as Marco said so beautifully, this web of life, and as a uh, Hindu said, it, this web of life upon which everything else that we know is based, we become divorced from it. But we're beginning to understand this but we just don't understand what the that the cause of some of the ailments that we have in our world is actually ecosystem degradation. 2015, 2016, this part of the world saw a huge uh, flow of migrants, immigrants, um, and destitute refugees from severe civil war. And this had implications in c for conversations in Europe, but I can tell you for those who were fleeing, it had implications too. Now, why were they moving? The TVs would tell you that they were moving because of conflict. That is true. But they were moving for other reasons too. Because if you go 10 years before that happened, before these wars broke out in Assad, Syria, you had 10 years of sustained drought. You had two million people on internally displaced in Syria. You had ecosystem collapsing and farms not producing in Syria, except we didn't know about this. Mm. So then, of course, political chess matches on the map of Syria, which was something else, people playing to hate, people playing to religious differences, ethnic differences, the usual stuff. But these people were already destitute. These people were already well. So we need to understand that when ecosystems collapse because we fail to take care of them, 
either because of climate change or because of other elements that we have done to this good earth, things happen. And wars and conflicts is one of them. Then we need to, I mentioned diseases, but I really want to, 60% of the medicines that you get are derived from plants. Hindus, people, and many indigenous people will take the plants directly and use this for their health. But many of the things that we buy in the pharmacy are derived from the, uh, the, uh, the, the natural system um, and chemically reproduced based on the DNA of the system. So nature is, uh, is our pharmacy, but nature is also where we get our diseases. And it is important to understand that when we have some of these global epidemics, like the bird flu, what was that all about? Well, this was about us stepping in and being, having our captivated birds, chickens, intermix and, and with, with uh, wild diseases that happen, with diseases that happen in the wild and not manage our, site, uh, our uh, sanitary um, aspects appropriately. As uh, even Ebola, some of these terrible diseases that can sweep, when we go right into ecosystems and interfere with them, diseases jump from bats, fr uh, from monkeys, as we know how HIV AIDS spread mm -hmm. between humans and primates. So we need to understand that our health, our food, our medicines are part of this. And we failed to communicate that. We're beginning, and I think, just like Marco said, with climate, we are getting there. And in a way, that's where the technology comes in. That's where technology can become a real conveyor of good information, mm -hmm. of, of making those point of touch that are broken constantly by different interests. But just last point, technology can also be used in so many other ways for good. And in the conservation world, whether we're talking about drones that tell us how migratory species are doing or how um, uh, difficult to get to places are, are, are being conserved or not, or whether it is about big data that we can mash. Uh, we at IUCN, we host a lot of very, very big data. Um, that we can mash and begin to show interconnectivity between species health, human health, et cetera, and, and growth outcomes. Those kind of things are also important and can deliver answers for the world, that the world needs for, for continued sustainability, quite frankly. So I think we should not consider technology um, frightening. We should embrace it, but we should have eyes wide open because of all the misuse of technology that is also happening. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I, uh, I take it from when Inga said, when ecosystem collapse, lives collapse. And then exactly when she talked about the migration, I feel like, oh, she's talking about me. Because mm -hmm. I'm coming from the Lake Chad regions. So for those who do not know, uh, especially the younger generation, so Lake Chad is the bigger lake in Chad and then it's uh, transboundary. So uh, like 50 years ago, it was 25,000 kilometers square of water, fresh water. And then actually now, it's 1,500 or maybe 2,000 kilometers square of, of mm -hmm. water. So 90% of the water just evaporated in less than half of one generation, 40, 50 years, just evaporated. And then imagine more than 30 millions now, and maybe 40 millions of people living around this place. So what are you calling that? This is the environmental degradation. This is the climate change impact. So this is the reality. It's not a fiction, because we do not use the water to do the industrialized agriculture or something else. Nothing, nothing, just so the heat wave. Mm -hmm. And then we have the study in my organization, like in 1901 to now, we have the about 1.5 degree of the temperature rest. So in the summer in Chad, we have more than 50 degree, five zero I'm saying, five zero degree in the sun. So how do you imagine you can live on this kind of place? 
So we cannot say that, we cannot ignore. I mean, there is no discourse for someone like me to say that we are ignoring climate change or environment degradation. Then if we're ignoring, we know that what's happening in London, in France, with all the flooding. What's happening with the fire? Fire in Sweden, fire in Sweden, who is the ice country, never happened. Fire in Canada, fi fire everywhere. So why there is the, all those temperature raising? Why there is, there is all those like uh, uh, flooding every place? So for us, it's a reality. So there is no need to deny or to say yes or no. This political talk, never mind. They just want to have the vote. But who are the majority? The peoples. So the peoples who are the majority now is starting to say no, we do not believe on you. Life has to change. And this is what's happening in France, in US, and now in every corner that people just are joining around Europe and marching. Why they are marching? They are marching like, we are poor, our life has to change and things. So okay, if the life has to change, it has to change from the beginning. Like our nature has to change. So the system needs to change. So that's what we want. But how the technology can help or not? When they say like geoengineering, biotechnology that can save us, I'm saying like, excuse me, who is creating the bio, uh, I mean the geotechnology or the biotechnology? It's not the human who create already the climate impact. What is the insurance or safeguard that giving me that what they're creating is going to save my life for the next 20 years? Because when they create the first industrialized revolutions, they say it's going to make our life easier. The noun is taking us to the extinctions of all the planet. So, because they need like some years before to confirm. Of course, we have to embrace it, but we have to embrace the technology who can adapt and help in our life. We have to adapt the technology who can be the tools for our life, but not to replace our life. No, when we have the cell phone, it's so useful to communicate between each other. That's very important. When we have internet, we say, okay, much more again, global is becoming like village. But as really Rick said, now in my community and in many other communities, like we say like, oh, my mom used like more time in her WhatsApp and Facebook rather than taking care of me. So, okay, the best friend of everyone, I think, like, okay, you watch your phone before you sleep and then when you wake up. So, no, we have to use it as tool. We don't have to get it to replace our life. And then I'm so sorry, like, in the community, then what's happening now? And so, people, when I was young, like, we have the history. When we stay down from my mom and everybody, so they tell us the history of the community, how we do that, if something happening, or how we do it. And now they just like watching the TV. At what time this serial is coming? Oh no, I, I missed yesterday. May you tell me these serials? No, come on. We cannot stop our life in the worst technology. We have to move our life with the best one and take the best one for our life. So technology can help but it cannot resolve, it cannot replace our life. Thanks. Very good. Great. Well, thank you all for those very profound comments, really. I want to turn now to the audience, to you, and give you an opportunity to ask some questions. And I'd particularly like to offer the opportunity to a student, to one of the young people who are here today, uh, and to encourage you <laughs> to be bold and take inspiration. Yes, please, go ahead. Why don't you stand up? Can you stand up so we can hear you? Uh, oh, here we go. We have a microphone for you also. Um, my question was, how can younger people that I'd say abuse technology and are so connected to technology that when we get more and more disconnected to nature, how can we find and build uh, a connection again using technology and also, but also how can we get out into nature more and get younger people, especially from cities, uh, to get out into nature more and find the natural human instinctive connection towards all living beings and understanding uh, biodiversity and the connection between every, every living thing. I'm gonna ask the panelists just 
for one person to respond to each question so we can take as many questions as possible. So maybe, Rickon, do you want to respond to that one? Sure, yeah. Since um, you, you have a giant online community at your disposal. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tell them to get offline and get outside. <laughs> so th yes. I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of practical answers to that question, which is that obviously we can use these technologies as a beautiful tool to go find all kinds of ways to do that. And we can do it together as friends. And we can connect to other people who have similar interests who want to do that and, and come together. And you can, you can post and share that idea and, 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 uh, and, and have it spread. Um, uh, but somehow the answer I want to give is deeper than that. Um, and what I, what I want to say is w that question, I think, came from a, a spark of, a, of something in you that you sort of said, this should happen, you know? Um, yeah, you felt it, right? Like, that's, you always feel it, right? Mm -hmm. it may, maybe it's something, it's something about who you are. And when we talked about those experiences we have in nature, where we go for a walk and we get something good that comes back, part of the thing about nature is getting away from that phone. I think what you might be drawn to, getting away from that phone and being in a forest, that beautiful living forest that Marco talked about, not just trees, but a forest, you know? It's a different thing, it's like a living organism. It connects us more to ourselves, to our truth, to our wisdom. What, what are we here for? What are we meant to do? And my number one piece of, you know, what I feel called to offer you in this moment is go to a forest, go for a walk, listen to yourself about what it is you feel called to do, everybody here. You know, and whether you're a policy wonk or an executive director of something or you're in grade five, wherever you are, listen for that because we are nature and nature wants to defend itself. Like, you know that, I don't want to ruin the Avatar movie. Uh, has anybody not seen the Avatar movie and doesn't want a spoiler right now? <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, I'm not going to ruin it then. <laughs> but, um, but there is this narrative of like the idea of nature defending itself. And we think about it as nature as something separate from us, but we are nature. Like we are the ones who can rise. This is our time. And if we listen to ourselves, I think we're gonna get sparks. There's probably dozens, 50, maybe 100 sparks in this room of specific things. And it might be something local. It might be something where you spark a flame. Like for me, the spark grew into something that now has 50 million people uh, following what we do at Avaz. And, and that is the promise of this technology that we now have, the world we live in. If you have a spark and it speaks to other people, it can travel fast. And we have so many people right now offering carefully designed, huge rooms of people using fear and anger to design exactly the right thing that's going to appeal to millions of people to get them more fearful and more angry. But you, we are the antidote to that. That spark you have of this feels right, this is a calling, put that out into the world and pursue it. And, and we will create a million flowers blooming and save this planet in the way we're meant to. Okay, Marco says he has something yeah, no, small kind of he has to say. No, I kind so of just to say yeah. one thing to you because you know, when I was your age, there was no mobile phone, so I just went into nature. But it's not either or. I think you can go to nature with the mobile phone. <laughs> and actually, we're going to launch soon as there will be an app. It's called iNaturalist. This is going to help using the technology in a good way to discover nature, to ask questions to others, to post pictures, to be part of a community that appreciates nature and share it with others around the world. This is an amazing opportunity that technology is giving us we never had before. So actually, it's not just either or. You don't have to switch off your phone and go to nature. You can go to nature with your phone on and be part of a community that loves nature and engage. Although if you're really lucky when you get out in the mountains, there'll be no service, but yeah. <laughs> that's getting yes. increasingly yes. rare. But um, you can take pictures. Okay, do we have another student, young person? How about right here in the front? Thank you very much. Um, we had a guest from China that came to our village and she was afraid of a goat because she thought that was a dog. But I find more people are way too much in the internet, looking around, don't, they forgot the real world. Yeah. And maybe if like, like you said, with a phone you can go out to nature and photograph it. And then like people can scroll in your phone and see that picture and say, oh, that's really nice. But then actually going out, these people that saw it, no one does that. So, yeah. Yeah.
I mean, already the way that you said is so lovely for me and so touching for me because someone from China who come and say, like, oh, I'm afraid it's a dog, it's not a god. So this is the relationship between the human being and our environment, our species. Because people used to say, like, oh, they say in Africa you don't have houses, so people have trees. So everyone have trees? I get these questions, like someone, so like everyone have his own tree? I said, like, yes, <laughs> I have my own tree, my mom has own tree, so that's our house. I'm like, you really normal? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> You know, so they are really like normal, seriously asking this kind of questions. Africa is trees, and then does it. So using your technology, also showing and putting the name, this is one way of sharing. But go further. The things I'm saying, like we are using our time a lot in all new technology, and then like in the phone, passing all our time in the phone. So forgetting about talking at the about the real life. So when people go to the supermarket, they buy the goat meat, it's already like cut in piece, red one, and pack it. At, at same as chicken, you, you take someone of two years, you ask like, where is the chicken is coming? They can tell you maybe it's coming from the tree. Or you ask <laughs> the fruit, like, uh, is it lemon or is it penis? Where is penis coming? So people say, oh, penis is a big tree there and giving the penis. <laughs> so then you feel like, well, okay, we need a different kind of education. So how we can change our daily life system, and that's I'm calling to the parents also for the education to ask the kids from the beginning and saying that like, oh, the chicken is like someone like bears and big and then living with the peoples in the house. Like the penis is just coming in the ground, it's a small plant. So this kind of education of the nature and environment can really help a lot. Like from our side, we don't know the world wide who exists in the Iceland. But how we understand that, we understand also through the TV, we say like, oh, these fox, okay, they're living in the ice, we are coming from the desert. Okay, it's an animal, it looks. So technology can help. But just to short to come back, how also we can disconnect from our technology. I feel like when I don't have my phone, I feel like it's something missing from myself, mm -hmm. that I'm sure like many of us is right there. But when like I go to the community, there is no service, nothing. I feel myself so peaceful, like nothing is outside there. It's only like the nature. I have my mind really clear. And then at the end of the day, you figure out you miss one day or you miss three days of no internet, no phone, nothing but life continues, <laughs> nothing change. <laughs> so just to think about that. You do not use it, but nothing will change. So use it, but fix your objective in your life. Say that I will stop at least one hour to do not look my phone, nothing will happen. No one will die, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so then we will catch up later. Yeah, nice, thank you. <laughs> How about, do we, do we have a young woman in the audience who might have a question? How about in the back over there? Yeah. No, I know. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm asking the elders to be patient because we're older, we can be patient. <laughs> so in the Middle East, there is the Red Sea Canal, which basically joins up a salty body of water with a sweet body of water. Mm -hmm. And it made huge impact in terms of marine transport, you know, because instead of like circumventing Africa, you can just cut through the canal. But it's also caused some serious ecological and environmental problems where these two um, ecosystems, like you know, fish, are, f fish that live in salt water are coming into sweet water and vice versa. And it's really, it's really causing a huge mess there. So my question to the panel is, to what extent or how do we decide when to sacrifice economic, uh, environmental, you know, wellness <coughs> for technological advancements? and if we even should do it in the first place? Maybe if I could um, respond to that, and thank you very, very much. Look, this is, th uh, so the Red Sea, I think you're thinking about the, 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 the Suez Canal and not the Red to Dead, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's just an idea from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. Thankfully, it hasn't been done. Um, but so, so, of course, it's a long time since the canal was built. Um, but it did and does and bring together two ecosystems that were not connected. And you get different fish species migrating into the Mediterranean 
um, from uh, the, the, the Red Sea. Um, and, and has had, and as it has been expanded, uh, has uh, implications. Now, it, it, it's a huge question, right? Because every one of us lives in a house. And that house was built. Well, and some of us live in trees. Some of us <laughs> live in trees, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so, and that house was built on something before. That was, uh, that was nature before, which got removed before. Um, many of us live in cities where there were flourishing places before that are not there now. So the human footprint is very real. And at times we forget that and we only think about the new footprint and not what we've already done. But on this earth, about 60% of the surface of the terrestrial earth, we've sort of, we've We've interfered with it. We live on it, we farm on it, we, uh, we do timber on it, we work on it. It's not at peace as nature. And much of that work has had some of the implications that we're talking about on some of this big footprint infrastructure that is gonna go in and down the road in Davos, we're talking about $70 trillion worth of infrastructure in the next 100 years. That will have an unbelievable footprint. And then f don't forget the, the footprint we already have already. So we need to think about every single piece of infrastructure and understand the impact that it has. And we need to con have a conversation about can we make it, is it essential? Can we mm -hmm. make it better such that it will be biodiversity positive, nature positive? And the truth is we can. There are interesting studies that show that in cities where you have greenery, because more and more of us will live in cities in, in 76, I think it was like 37%. In, a in 2016, it was 54%, and it's projected to be 70% in 30, uh, 2036. So we are seeing, we are urbanizing. But when you put green in cities, children, who are exposed to green. And this is amazing for, for you, the young man who asked about uh, getting into nature. Little kids, if they are exposed to green, the neurons, their brains develop differently. It's shocking, right? But there are these studies that show kids that were brought up in concrete jungles and kids that have exposure to green and you are checking for income differentials and it shows that the neurons and the wiring is different, it's faster. And, and even there was, some, well, there was one study I saw where you had a school, one class, and a class stayed in the same school from year one to grade seven. They were looking at a concrete wall, and the other one was looking at a park, and they were looking at greenery. You know what? And they never shifted, so they were stuck there for seven years. The kids in the green that could look at that greenery, they had better scores. It's shocking, mm. but it's true. So we need to think about the kind of footprint and impact, but as we are urbanizing, and we need to do environmental assessment and all the right thing and think biodiversity positive, but since it is a fact that there, is more people, there are more people on this good earth, and as it is a fact that we are moving into cities, we must insist, and we are taxpayers, we are voters, we are voices, we must insist that those cities are livable, pedestrian friendly, green, so that kids can be exposed to green and get nature even in cities. Finally, we know that there are some doctors now who instead of writing a prescription for you know medicines, they write, if you come with stress, if you come with diabetes, if you come with cardiovascular, and if you come with some mental health problems, they give you a prescription for two hours in nature exposed to green mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. This is it, Rx Nature, because it relieves your mind and you do not get onto that website while you're in it. <laughs> <laughs> you actually experience nature, you live it, you feel it, you love it, you hear it, you freeze it, you sweat it. It's in you, you are in it, that's what you do. And that's a way also that we find balance in our lives and in ourselves. So that's, uh, that's one way of putting it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really wonderful. Um, 
the most painful part of being a moderator is not being able to take all the questions from the audience. The most painful thing about being in the World Economic Forum is the limited amount of time we have <laughs> with amazing people who have so much to say. So I am forced at this point um, to bring us to our final closing stage of this session. And yeah. so, uh, e even I can sacrifice, no, oh, even okay. I can sacrifice 30 seconds of my time, okay. I want to give it to Okay, him. this is a very generous person, thank you. All right, uh, if you can make it very quickly, please go ahead. Thank, thank you, Hindu, very kind of you. <laughs> I would like to say thank you to the indigenous people who are here, and what you said is so precious, and we need much more people to at the World Economic Forum like you, who say clearly what, is, what we should do. Since 1971, the World Economic Forum talks about improving the state of the world. Actually, they are doing this exactly the opposite. They want infinite, endless growth of the GDP. But growth of the GDP is destroying nature day by day. Our footprint will be nearly two planets soon, very soon. And we talk about that every day we lose around 150 species and plants every day. This is because our religion to growth. Now the question goes to the lady from Chad. One growth is the population growth. All 20 years you have the double of population. What are your suggestions to the community at the WEF and to Mr. Labertini? What are you doing within the uh, public and within the World Economic Forum to stop the compulsion to growth? There is no problem with growth if there are needs, but if there is a compulsion to growth, this is sick, this is completely nuts. What is your feeling about that? And what are you doing about it? Thank you. Hindu, do you want to have a quick response to that? My feeling about, ba about that, I'm feeling so sad and so bad, as you said, like things are not moving. But I'm optimistic because I have people like all the colleagues here in the panel who are coming to change the way of how, how they're deciding. But the question is, are they going to implement it back home? So either they do that normally, either it's going to be by the peoples, because as I said, what's happening in France and in US is going to be a people movement, and then we can shift in by going all together. We are many than them. They have more money, we have more voices. Thank you, that's great, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I have about three minutes left, so um, I just wanna give each of the panelists the opportunity, we'll make it one minute each. If you just wanna have one last word about one particular thing you would like people to leave here today remembering, or one particular ask you have um, of us as members of the forum or as the audience, as citizens who have voices, what would it be? And uh, do you wanna just pick up and complete the thought you had a moment ago? So for the member of the forum, I think so what I want from you to continue this kind of debate of the real peoples and reals, I mean, talks into this forum to change the way that it's not only economy, there is no economy without peoples. And then there is peoples without economy who can suffer, but how we can combine and give the equity. So for the audience here, what I want from you, and especially all the young people who are in the room, you are the leaders of tomorrow because this generation is going to define your entire life for the future. So it's your action. So every action matter. So you need to stand up for now, not stand up for someone else, for yourself. So go sustainably, environment protection is the way that you are going to save your life. So if the elders make the mess, so give them the way to make it better. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so for me, there are two, two, two messages. Of course, one uh, is the most difficult one, but the most important one. Everyone needs to begin to walk the talk. Everyone needs to begin to change our own lives, our own consumption models, the way we relate to our society, and, uh, and, and, and green our behaviors. Reduce energy, uh, push for uh, uh, renewable energy, consume food that does not have a high heat fo uh, footprint on the planet. So many ways we could actually, in our own direct life, change things. And every time you do something, think about that something times eight billion people. If everybody will do the little thing, 
the change will be massive. So starting from our own lives, we need to change a lot. The second thing, speak up. Speak up your mind. Speak to your friends, speak to your family, to your peers, people in your classroom, your workplace. Spread the word about the need to value nature and to protect nature. We are going to call for the governments of the world in 2020 to develop a new deal for nature and to agree to a new deal for nature that is similar to the new deal for climate that was agreed in Paris, the two sides of the ecological challenge. We're pushing, we're going to push government very, far, very hard and companies, and that's what we're doing in WEF as well, to really green their production system. And of course, we need to push people to green their consumption system as well. For that new deal for nature, we need millions, millions of people, like it happened in Paris for climate, to speak out, maybe go even down in the streets and march and say, we need to fix these problems. Agriculture, fishing, infrastructure, we cannot go on this way, food production. And so we need people, voices, and I hope they will join the movement because every big change in the world has always started and finished with people asking for it. So we really count on people's support. I want to pick up right from there because I think uh, this is going to get fixed if we fix it, and we have an opportunity, um, and it's, it's in the next few years. It's certainly this generation, um, but if we can come together as one people and push our politicians and our leaders and our businesses and our civil society organizations and all of us together to embrace the solutions that our scientists are telling us we need to fix this problem, we will fix this problem. And the the thing I want to offer you is that in my experience with the Paris Agreement, which I think was a real wonderful step forward um, on climate change, I felt there were two opponents. One was the established interests and inertia, some of the oil companies who just didn't want to see their business models go away. And the other was a kind of fear and demonization of any opportunity we had to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. There were people who said, ah, the UN sucks, burn it down, we need a, you know, it's never going to agree on anything, we're never going to get any progress, you know, you can't trust any politician, they're all liars, they're all, like da. that kind of people power, I think, is one of the greatest threats to our future. It's not wise, it's not true, and the mental illness we have, and that's seizing our world right now, and that Facebook and Twitter, it's pushing that kind of people power. But I feel that when you go into a forest and you walk and you think, what does the world need? What do I need to do? You don't get fear and anger and, and hatred. You get love uh, and you get creative instincts. And that's what we need to bring. That's the people power where we're connecting across all these rooms, Davos in the village and Davos in the summit. We're connecting across these rooms, calling people out on stuff like compulsion to growth, but in a creative, constructive way. That's the people power that will save the world. And then I think we are wise enough and good enough now to bring. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I think my colleagues have said some great, great points, so I'm not sure I can add much here, but I will say connect with nature. Connect with nature because and open yourself up to it. Marcus spoke on his own childhood. I have a story similar. And, and connect with nature and speak up. Speak up. What we see when we speak up as a giant chorus, we actually change the world. It's remarkable that in just a few years, plastic has come so much to the fore. Everybody is aware of it. Was it that turtle with a straw being pulled out of its nose? Mm -hmm. Was it that bird with a, with a plastic in its belly? Was it the mother bird feeding its, its baby birds little plastic pieces? Everyone I talk to have seen those on YouTube, <laughs> but it revolted us. We felt disgusted and we thought, my goodness, we gotta do something. We now need to find the same strength to do that for nature. And I believe that this conversation and similar conversations are exactly what is needed to find that voice, to create that movement, to save the planet, for the planet's sake, but also for ours. Thank you. All right, we are just about out of time, but before you leave, I just wanna say two things. First of all, I wanna thank all of you so much 
for taking the time to be here with us today and for caring about this issue and for raising important questions. I'd like to thank the forum for all the hard work they do and especially for making the open forum possible, which to my mind is the most important part uh, of this whole event and for me the most rewarding part of it. And third of all, um, I'd like to introduce, I'd like to invite Nishad Shafi to come up to the, come up with us, join us now, and just spend one minute, so take one more minute of your time to talk to you about a new forum initiative that we hope you'll all participate in. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be among this uh, idols of mine. I've been always <laughs> being uh, captivated and motivated by their speeches and their articles. I've been reading all my lifetime. So I'm a global shaper with the World Economic Forum, and we have released Voice for Planet. Like they said, it's people moment. And like she said, like Hindu said, we are not the leaders of tomorrow, we are the leaders now. Like you have seen the climate march, you see how young people coming up, it's the time look, young people stand up. And it's a cooperation. It's like why we are in Davos is because we believe everybody has their responsibilities. And it starts with individually what you take and what you care for. Voice for Our Planet is the amazing platform where you can commit to your commitments or take your pledge mm -hmm. that what you're gonna do. And it takes each one of you to sign up and say what you want from yourself and your government and the business. And this will be uh, uh, taken up in uh, World Biodiversity uh, event in China in 2020 to showcase our government leaders and business leaders to a new deal for nature, like how we had a Paris Agreement for climate change, two spears of the same thing, ending up making sure we live in this beautiful planet, how we have to, like their generation live, and we have a long to go, and we have to actually give up our next generation. So go to www.voiceforthe.planet, sign your petition, Take your pledge, what you can do in your daily life, and also how you call for action from your governments and business. Thank you. Voice for the Planet. Yeah. It's voiceforthe.planet.org. You can see the website. It's voiceforthe.planet.org. Thank use you. your mobile phone. That's how you use the technology. <laughs> <laughs> but only after you've gone for a good walk. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, I want to thank our wonderful panel for their generosity and their time. Thank all of you for coming. And again, thank the forum for making this possible. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.